Nehemiah 9, verses 28 to 38. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you delivered them time after time. You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, uh, of which you say, the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you won them through your prophets, but they paid no attention, so they gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes, the hardship that has come on us and our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law, and they did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave, to, you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today in the land you gave our ancestors so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all these, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders and our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals to it. Nehemiah 9, 28 to 38. Israel is the people of God in the Old Testament. If we were to read the story of Israel from Abraham to the return from the exile, a span of 1,200 years, we will find out that Israel has not been faithful to God. There are many times in which God has allowed uh, Israel's enemies to conquer them. Um, because of their unfaithfulness before God. Uh, here in Nehemiah 9, the people are aware of their unfaithfulness to God. In fact, they are crying and weeping before God. Ezra, the teacher of God's law, has shared with them their history. Uh, the Levites who are priests uh, have explained God's word to them. As a, result, as a result, they wear sackcloth and put dust on their foreheads. Nehemiah 9, 30 to 31. For many years um, you were patient with them and by your spirit uh, you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. Uh, so you gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples, but in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Nehemiah 9, 30 to 31. Their enemies have conquered them and scattered them. In fact, the two main characters in the book of Nehemiah come from the main cities of their conquerors. Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king, is from Susa, the capital of Persia, and Ezra from Babylon. Many times God has sent them his spirit and warned them, Return to me, return to me. However, they paid no attention. Their ancestors decide to adopt the gods and idols of the Canaanites rather than listen to God's spirit. When the people of Israel entered the promised land after 40 years in the desert, they conquered the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. Most of these tribes do not exist during Nehemiah's time. The people of Israel pour their hearts out before God in their confession. They are slaves again, but not in Egypt. They are slaves of Persia in their own land. Nehemiah 9, 
But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. Nehemiah 9, 36-37 Twice in this prayer of confession, Nehemiah mentions that God sends His Spirit to instruct them. However, they refuse to listen to God's Spirit or the prophets to whom the Spirit speaks. Uh, this time it is different. In Nehemiah 9, the Holy Spirit brings them to a sense of conviction and confession. They now confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors before God. The Holy Spirit is the personal presence of God in our lives. As we read the Bible, it is the Holy Spirit who touches our hearts with God's Word. The Holy Spirit convicts Israel of their sins. There is now a sense of national confession and repentance before God. May I share with you the story of Richard. It is the Holy Spirit who brings Richard to a sense of confession before God. Richard shares his story in a devotional booklet. We know we are supposed to confess our sins and seek forgiveness. But imagine finding not a forgiving God, but a judge who is about to sentence us to life in prison. How would that change our outlook on confession? The answer to this question is, it doesn't have to. Having accepted Christ into my life six days after my arrest, I stood before the judge, knowing that I could not both stand for Christ and lie on the witness stand. So I confessed, and according to the penalty prescribed by law, was given a life sentence. Confessing was one of the most difficult things I have ever done, but ironically, it, is, it was also the most rewarding. God took the small faith I had uh, when I told the truth in court and began a work that has sustained me for over 20 years in one of the world's toughest prisons. I do not think this would have been possible had I refused to confess my sin and live for God. By confessing our sins before God and people, we also confess our total reliance upon God's grace and mercy. The measure of mercy we receive depends on our willingness to admit our shortcomings. Our reward is a closer, more intimate relationship with the one who someday will judge the world. We are no different from Richard. We might not be facing a criminal charge, yet the same Holy Spirit who works in Richard's heart is also working in our hearts. May we listen to the Holy Spirit. Israel confesses that they have acted wickedly before God. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you want them to keep. Nehemiah 9, 33-34. They cannot run away from their former wrongdoings. Uh, they acknowledge that neither they nor their ancestors have followed God's law. Instead, they have ignored God. Yet, although they have been unfaithful, God remains faithful to them. God might have allowed their enemies to conquer them, but God hangs on to them even while in exile. As a result, Israel remains as Israel even though they are in exile. They are grateful to God for constantly being by their side and keeping them together as Israel. Nehemiah 9 verse 31 But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. We have been persevering through this pandemic through prayer, constant hand sanitizing, physical distancing, and mask wearing. In your great mercy, Lord, you kept us safe. You have not abandoned us. You are a 
gracious and merciful God. Having confessed their sins and appealing to God's grace and mercy, they now ask God to save them from their hardship. They appeal to God not to forget them. Nehemiah 9 verse 32 Now therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all these hardships seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us, on our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all our, your people, from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. When Israel prays this prayer, they hope that God will restore a physical Jewish king like King David, who will overthrow the Persian Empire. God does hear their prayers, but answers them in God's own way, not theirs. Although they pray that they will be liberated from the Persian Empire, God has already used this Persian Empire for God's own purposes. It is the Persian king himself who has decreed that the people of Israel return to Jerusalem from all over the empire. It is the Persian king who has sent Nehemiah and Ezra back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and remind the people of God's law. Who moved this Persian king to do all these things? It is their God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love. A physical king of Israel like King David will never be restored to Israel. Instead, for the next 500 years, uh, the Persian Empire will be replaced by different empires. First by the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, and then by the Roman Empire. By the time of Jesus, it is Rome who rules over Israel. King Herod is the Edomite king who rules over Jerusalem at the birth of Jesus by the permission of Rome. God does hear their prayers, but answers in God's own way. The Jerusalem temple and wall still stands. Israel keeps their faith in their God. In fact, there are various movements like the Pharisees who begin studying God's law in the tradition of Ezra, the teacher of God's law. However, God does not establish a physical Jewish king like King David. God does hear their prayers, but answers them in God's way, not theirs. However, ironically, yet in some ways, God does hear Israel's prayer for a king. About 450 years later, a king is born in a manger in a stable in Bethlehem, the city of David. Magi come from the east to worship this baby king and bring him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The king does not rule, the king does rule over his people. However, he does not rule by a sword. Instead, he rules by teaching, preaching, praying, and healing people. People do come to him, but not as a traditional king. This king demonstrates his kingship not by military conquest, but by dying on the cross. The story becomes even stranger. God raises this king from the dead. God brings him back to the heavenly throne. Uh, this king now rules as the king of kings, but from that heavenly throne. God does answer our prayers, but not always in the way we want God to answer our prayers. God answers our prayers God's way. Max Lucado, the pastor and author, shares this conversation with his six-year-old daughter. When my oldest daughter was about six years old, she and I were having a discussion about my work. It seems she wasn't too happy about my chosen profession. She wanted me to leave the ministry. I like you as a preacher, she explained. I just really wish you sold snow cones. An honest request from a pure heart. It made sense to her that the happiest people in the world are the people who drove snow cone trucks. You play music, you sell goodies, you make kids happy. What more? Could you want? Come to think of it, she may have had a point. I could get a loan, buy a truck, and ha, huh, I eat too much. I heard her request, but didn't heed it. Why? 
because I knew better. I know that I'm called to I know what I'm called to do and what I need to do. The fact is I knew more about life than she did. Same with God. God hears our requests, but his answer is not always what we'd like it to be. Why? Because God knows more about life than we do. God hears our requests, but his answer is not always what we'd like it to be. Why? Because God knows more about life than we do. Amen.